There seems to be a new theory on this case at least once every couple of years. New suspects, advanced profiling methods, and many conspiracy theories have popped up over the last 54 years. These theories led to the near-mythical legacy of this decades-long cold case. In July 2023, a new series viewed on the Peacock streaming service explores a controversial theory on the Zodiac killings that has struck a chord with many amateur true crime enthusiasts. The theory can be summed up with the synopsis for the two-part series. The identity of the serial killer known as the Zodiac has been confounding investigators for nearly 50 years, but an unlikely and unconventional theorist may have finally shed light to America's most famous cold case by asking a question that no one else has ever dared ask. What if the reason the Zodiac has never been caught is because he never existed in the first place? Thomas Horan, an amateur investigator and English teacher, published The Myth of the Zodiac Killer, a literary investigation in 2014, a book that serves as the series basis. The Myth of the Zodiac Killer director Andrew Nock and author Horan have examined every piece of evidence, news clipping and detail from the Zodiac Killer cases and believe there may not have been a serial killer behind the homicides. Horan in particular believes that it is nothing more than fiction created as letters, stories and hypotheses dominated the discourse surrounding the case and manipulated public opinion. Is there any tangible proof pointing to the fact that the same individual perpetrated all these crimes? The captivating two-part true crime documentary series examines the intriguing theories of Nock and Horan. Faraday and Jensen the Zodiac's reign of terror began with the murders of David Faraday, 17, and Betty Jensen, 16, in December 1968. Teenagers were attacked on a remote road known as Lover's Lane. One detail about the 1968 murders of Faraday and Jensen suggests an alternative explanation for who carried out the murders and why. Just days before the murder, Faraday was reportedly involved in an altercation with another student from his school at a restaurant. He confronted the young man regarding his alleged drug dealings, threatening to expose him and imploring him to stop. At that time in Vallejo, California, where the homicides occurred, there was an upsurge of significant drug trafficking and motorcycle gang violence. Nate Gartrell, a journalist, concedes that motorcycle gang members took any threat of being turned into the authorities seriously. Horan hypothesizes that the same young man or his companions may have followed Faraday and Jensen to Lake Herman Road and murdered them to prevent Faraday from speaking. Michael Magoo and Darlene Farron Over a year later in July 1969, Michael Magoo, 19, and Darlene Farron, 22, were attacked. Magoo survived the attack and provided the initial description of the assailant, stating that he was 26 to 30 years old, 195 to 200 pounds or possibly even more, 5 foot 8 inch, white male, with short, light brown curly hair. The alleged killer made a confessional phone call shortly after perpetrating the crime. Horan, however, believes this was merely an attempt to divert attention away from the real killer and place responsibility on the alleged serial killer responsible for the similar double murder of Faraday and Jensen a year earlier. Horan cites Farron's ex-husband, Jim Crabtree, who had a criminal record and reportedly had a tumultuous relationship with Farron during their marriage as a possible suspect who was never thoroughly investigated. Crabtree had a car similar to the killer's and had previously been accused of stalking Farron. Crabtree, who was located and interviewed for the documentary series, asserts that he had an alibi at the time of the homicide. He claims he was intoxicated on drugs and celebrating the 4th of July alone in a park far away, as usual for the holiday. Crabtree asserts that he had prior expertise in the field of cryptography, although others claim that this is not the case and that instead, during his time in the military, he served as a clerk typewriter. He also told Nock, disturbingly, that he wished Ferrin would be punished nine times for moving on so quickly with someone else, mirroring the nine times she was shot. Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard 
Hartnell and Shepard were picnicking at Lake Berryessa on September 27, 1969. A white man approximately 5 feet 11 inches tall and weighing more than 170 pounds approached them, wearing a black executioner's hood with sunglasses over the eye holes and a white cross circle symbol on a bib-like garment on his chest. The killer had brought pre-cut lengths of plastic clothesline and instructed Shepard to bind Hartnell before he did so himself. After discovering that Shepard had loosely bound Hartnell's wrists, he tightened Hartnell's restraints. The man then drew a knife and repeatedly stabbed them both. Hartnell sustained six wounds, while Shepard sustained ten. Dennis Land, a park ranger, discovered Hartnell gravely injured and contacted the authorities. Even though Land did not match the description of the man, a group of college girls saw loitering nearby shortly before the assault, there are some discrepancies, packaged up the crime scene, essentially destroying it, including the towel on which the victims were lying, and turned over the evidence to police upon their arrival. Second, he was out of radio contact for a period of time that coincided with the occurrence of the attack. While Land does not match the description of the man provided by the college girls and is described favorably by other authorities who knew him, some find the trained officer's behavior peculiar which includes destroying a crime scene. The ciphers. One of the most gripping parts of the Zodiac case is the various letters and ciphers. On August 1, 1969, the Vallejo Times Herald, the San Francisco Chronicle, and the San Francisco Examiner received three letters purportedly written by the Zodiac. The nearly identical letters, written by someone you would expect to be brooding and isolated, as described by a psychiatrist, claimed responsibility for the shootings at Lake Herman Road and Blue Rock Springs. According to the killer's claim, each letter also had one-third of a 408-symbol cryptogram containing his identity. The killer demanded that they be printed on the front page of each newspaper, or else he would cruise around all weekend killing lone people in the night, then move on to kill again until I end up with a dozen people over the weekend. The San Francisco Examiner received a letter on August 7, 1969, saying, Dear Editor, this is the Zodiac speaking. This was the first occasion the killer used this name to identify himself. The letter was written in response to Chief Stiltz's request for added proof that he had murdered Faraday, Jensen, and Ferron. In it, the Zodiac provided information about the murders that had not yet been made public. He added that when the police decipher his code, they will have me. On October 14, 1969, the Chronicle received another letter from the Zodiac, which included a section of Paul Stein's bloodied shirt tail as evidence that he was the killer and had a threat to kill pupils on school buses. To accomplish this, Zodiac wrote, just shoot out the front tire and then pick off the kiddies as they come bouncing out. On November 8, 1969, the Zodiac sent a card containing another 340-character cryptogram. On November 9, 1969, the Zodiac mailed a seven-page letter claiming that three minutes after shooting Stein, two police officers stopped and spoke with him. On November 12, excerpts from the letter were published in the Chronicle. On December 20, 1969, exactly one year after the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen, the Zodiac mailed a letter to prominent attorney Martin Bell containing another piece of Stein's shirt and a request for help. The vast majority of letter analysis centers on handwriting. However, with technological advancements, other factors can be analyzed. This happened when Nock gave the Zodiac letters to French computational linguistic specialists Jean-Baptiste Comp and Florian Coffiero. He explains in the series that they applied computer science principles to the analysis and synthesis of language and speech and ran the data through a customized AI model. The goal is potentially collecting evidence to support or refute the claims that distinct individuals penned the letters. The experts discovered distinguishable differences in the author's word choice and, most importantly, syntax, which strongly suggests that a different person wrote the letters that followed the first four letters. They explain that most people are aware of handwriting analysis and can easily alter their handwriting to conceal it, 
and full expert analysis. However, changing one's writing style and syntax is more complex and not even considered by the author. The observed alterations may be the consequence of a psychological shift in the author or culprit. However, the duo believes that their analysis shows a need for added research. Horan feels that the letters are the only evidence believers of a single killer have. The only so-called evidence that does link any of these murders together is these letters taking credit for the murders, Horan says in the series. Intervention by journalists for personal gain while the Zodiac Killer letters were initially sent to various media organizations, the San Francisco Chronicle eventually became the sole recipient of Zodiac correspondence. At one point, the writer of the letters began to explicitly address Paul Avery, who was portrayed by Robert Downey Jr. in David Fincher's 2007 film Zodiac. One letter contained an apparent bloodied fragment of victim Paul Stein's clothing, which was determined to be a match. According to law enforcement officials, no one, including journalists, would have had access to steal and plant this evidence. Some, however, highlight the friendly relationship between police officers and journalists in those days. There were also widespread reports of corruption and evidence manipulation at that time. Therefore, the docuseries suggests that someone behind the scenes could have provided the media with the sliver of Stein's bloodied shirt. It should come as no surprise that keeping the story and investigation alive benefited newspapers financially. However, even though many of Avery's contemporaries, including those who referred to him as unsavory Avery, recognized his belligerent nature, they do not believe he would have concocted a story using a legal means to attract attention. However, many find it odd and puzzling that the letters began to be sent only to the San Francisco Chronicle and, more particularly, to Avery. On October 27, 1970, the Zodiac did something that had never been done before by naming a specific individual in a letter. A Halloween card was enclosed in an envelope addressed to Paul Averly and sent to the Chronicle. Inside the card was a message that read, Peekaboo, you're doomed from your secret pal. The letter from the Zodiac caused considerable uproar. The police issued Avery a gun permit and he always carried a firearm. Partially for their own safety and partly to make light of a terrifying situation, his colleagues would wear badges on their uniforms that read, I am not Avery. Horan's theory is not without controversy. Michael Butterfield, the writer of ZodiacKillerFacts.com, said that he'd rather debate a ham sandwich than engage with Horan. One Redditor was less subtle in his opinion of Horan's work, saying, It's a collection of bad arguments, weasel words, and ideas that require logical leaps so large they make William of Ockham spin in his grave. It honestly reminds me more of the work of a creationist or a flat earther than anything else. The methods are much the same. If you don't simply accept his arguments at face value, the entire thing falls apart because it's built on absolutely nothing. Taking it at all seriously would be a terrible mistake, I'd say. The myth of the Zodiac Killer director Andrew Nock has one hope for the case. My hope is that someday there'll be a yard sale in Napa County, and one of these days, someone's gonna find an old trunk and in it will be the Zodiac hood, he said. Because whoever took the time to sew this is going to cherish this thing, which is what a forensic psychologist told me. And I think one of these days, it's gonna show up, he said. How does the myth of the Zodiac Killer hold up to the thousands of other theories on the Zodiac Killer? Leave us your comments below, we would love to hear from you. If you love our content and want to support the channel, feel free to check our web shop where you can find exclusive true crime merch brought to you by Bad Things.